Well, good morning again, and welcome one more time to Cross Community Church. If you have not been here in a while, we are nearing the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, this was the inaugural sermon of Jesus, where he began his earthly ministry. He began preaching to the people. He's gone up on the mountaintop. He sat down, and he's begun to teach about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, what it looks like to live as a citizen of God's kingdom while we're still here on this earth earth. And he's been laying out these principles for us. Now, here at the end of the sermon, it's like the invitation, if you will. Jesus is giving us a series of four warnings to everyone who has heard what he has already had to say. Um, He's giving us four warnings that essentially say, hey, don't miss out on what I've just told you. Don't miss out on enjoying the kingdom of God and living fully as a believer and a disciple of Jesus Christ while you're here on this earth. So last week, Jesus said, there is a narrow gate and a narrow path that's going to lead you toward life. There is a wide gate and a broad path that's going to lead you toward death and destruction, and most people Go that way. When I was a kid, we, we used to play a game. We were younger, and boys are just mean to each other because that's, that's how we are. Uh, we get a group of boys together. Maybe it's a birthday party. Maybe, I don't know, you have some friends over. And we would, uh, someone would, would kind of pose a question. Hey, does anyone want to go snipe hunting? Now, if you don't know what a snipe is, it's a little bitty bird that you actually can hunt. They don't actually exist around here, though. And so with snipe hunting, we were not going to kill anything. We were going to humiliate one of our friends. That was kind of the goal. So we would tell them, of course, it'd be the most naive among us. Hey, do you want to go snipe hunting? Well, sure. How do you do that? Well, snipe are peculiar creatures. Uh, You only hunt them at night, and what you do is you get a stick and a little sack, and uh, you herd them into the bag. Now, they're really scared of light, so you can't have a light with you. Um, If you want to go snipe hunt, we'll we'll show you how to do it. And so what you would do is you would take your friend way out into the middle of nowhere, preferably, right? And you would position them with a stick and a sack and be ready to to herd the snipe into the bag, and the rest of us would go away to scare the snipe toward the person with the bag. Now, if you, this never happened to you, what everyone else would do is go home laughing the whole way that your friend is out there in the middle of nowhere, lost, doesn't know where he is, it has no light, thinking he's hunting snipe while you're at the house eating snacks and drinking Cokes. It was kind of a cruel game that we would play uh, to the most naive of our friends, and we played it often, and we played it well. So if I did that to you, I'm sorry today. That wasn't a very kind thing to do. Now, I tell you that story uh, because it, in a sense, mirrors uh, what happens in our society today. Now, it, it may not seem that way to us, and it may not seem that harsh in particular, but what is happening in our society today, what Jesus has been warning against, are people who would wish to deceive us and mislead us in that way. That Jesus is going to address false prophets today, and those are the people who would be telling you, hey, you are on the path to life, like you're going the right way. This is the reality of the world when in reality something else is true. Those false prophets would like to lead you, like I did my friends in snipe hunting, into a place where you find yourself in the dark, lost, alone, and confused. And wouldn't it be a tragedy? If you and I spent our entire lives thinking we were on that narrow path that led to life, only to the, in the end find that we've been walking the wrong path the entire time. These false prophets that Jesus is going to tell us about, they existed in his day, and they exist in ours too. So he's going to give us a warning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to begin in verse 15. Here's what Jesus says. Now, remember, this is his inaugural sermon that he's preaching, and this warning comes in the very beginning, the very first sermon that was preached. After he's just said, hey, walk careful about what gate you enter through, what path you're walking in this life, otherwise you might miss the kingdom of God, he would say, now, second thing, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So this word beware, this is in the Greek, this is an imperative. He's, he's using an emphatic voice here like, hey, be really careful with this. 
Those of you who would be seeking after the kingdom of God, who, who want to find life in Christ, who want to know who God really is, be really careful that you're not led astray by one of these false prophets. Now, when many of us hear kind of this, this first warning that Jesus gave, there's a, a broad path that leads to destruction and a narrow path that leads to life, we, we have a tendency to think, oh, I know those people who walk the broad path. Right? Those are the agnostics and the atheists, the people that say, I hate God, there is no God. They're the, the people like living it up, walking the highway to hell. Right? That's who we think are walking the broad path. And yet Jesus, in delivering these warnings, he's not talking to a bunch of unbelievers or unreligious or undevout people. He's talking to Jews. Now, Jews worship the same God that we worship. They worship the God is revealed in the Old Testament, God the Father, Yahweh. They revered him. And it's in the midst of a group of religious and devout people that Jesus says, hey, be careful about which path you're walking. Be careful about listening to false prophets. And he describes what these false prophets are. Now, he says this, that they are ravenous wolves. They're essentially wolves in sheep's clothing. These false prophets are ones who falsely claim to speak on behalf of God. Now, think about this. Here we would be. The, the Jewish people were. They wanted to know, how do I live a life that's pleasing to God? How do I have a right relationship with God? And these false prophets were coming in and were saying, hey, here's the way. When in reality, that wasn't the way toward God at all. That wasn't the way toward life at all. It was a way, it was a path toward destruction now, Jesus describes them again as ravenous wolves. You ever been ravenous? This is what happens to my kids every single day with the moment I pick them up from school, right? They have this overwhelming hunger. They can't think about anything else until they get a snack. He's saying ravenous wolves. They're hungry. They have an appetite for something. You know what wolves do to sheep, right? They devour them. They consume them. These false prophets who would be among the sheep are there to satisfy their own appetites. And it might be fame they're after. It might be money they're after. We're not told what all the motivations might be. But we know that the wolves have come to satisfy their appetites. It was true then and it is true today. In Luke chapter 20, verses 47 and 48, Jesus highlights. He like puts his finger on it. Here's some false prophets in your day for the Jewish people, right? So here's what he says. He says, beware of the scribes. Now, when Jesus said that, everyone would have been like, what? The scribes? Like, they're, the, they're the elites. Those are the guys with the book deals. Those are the guys who are speaking at the conferences, these are the people that everyone's talking about what they just said. They got the television. Those are the guys that everyone's looking to. But here's what Jesus says about them. He says, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes. They love respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues at places of honor at banquets. Those who devour widows' houses. Those men who are out defrauding. Those who are vulnerable and weak. Those who, for appearance sake, they offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. These guys, they looked the part and they acted the part. They even prayed the part. If you would have seen these guys from a distance, you probably would have been impressed. If you would have showed up to the synagogue, it was kind of the ruling body of the Jews. They would have been the ones with the, the chief seats. They would have been kind of at the front of house. They would have been the keynote speakers. Jesus says, hey, beware of these people. Because they're leading you in the wrong direction. These guys use religious language and they showed outward devotion. And here's the problem with false prophets. They are indistinguishable from true prophets at first and from a distance. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. You know what a wolf in sheep's clothing looks like from a distance? Sheep. And so Jesus tells us we have to be where. In uh, Matthew chapter 23, he talks about these false prophets in the, the time of the Jews. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. For you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. These men were teaching in such a way that they were leading people astray from the kingdom of God. And can I say this to us today? 
we would be naive to believe that the same thing isn't happening in our culture and in our midst today. They're probably not wearing long, flowing robes, and they may not sit in a synagogue because, well, we don't have any of those around here, right? But they might occupy positions of prominence, and they might be people that you would be tempted to look to and think, hey, they've got it together spiritually. Those are people that I might should follow. He goes on in verse 25 of Matthew 23. He says, Woe to you again, scribes and Pharisees, because you travel around on sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he becomes one, that's a convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. See, there's a danger for us as the church of God today. As those who have been called to be salt and light in the world, to represent Jesus to the world, to reflect his glory and his goodness to the world, there is a danger that we would not be discerning and that we might buy into false teachings from false prophets and begin to teach those same things ourselves. That we would become false prophets, that we would portray false truths about God. Now, you may not think, you're like, what do you mean? I don't, I don't do that. Did you know that your life speaks? Your life speaks to the worth of God, to the goodness of God, to the sincerity of sin. We've got to be careful that the message that we preach, either with our lips or our lives, that we're not teaching something about God that isn't fully true. Now, really good news for us. Uh, with regard to false prophets, uh, Jesus is going to tell us how we should identify them. So he goes on here in verse 16 of Matthew 7, and he says, You will know them by their fruits. What does that mean? He goes on. He says, Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are figs from thistles, are they? And the answer, if you know about grapes and figs, is the answer is no, of course not. Grapes, vines, they produce grapes, not thorns, not fig trees. It's just one thing, right? You only have one type of fruit. I have a, a little apple tree in my backyard, and I've never once gone out and thought, man, I hope there's some plums today. It's, it's really common sense stuff that Jesus is telling us. You will know that if it is a, an olive tree, it's going to produce olives, and an apple tree is going to produce apples. And he said, in the same way, you ought to be able to look at the lives the fruit of those that you might want to follow, the fruit of those who are teaching, who are pouring into your life, you ought to be able to look at their lives and see the fruit of the gospel. You ought to see the fruit of the Spirit evident, right? Fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. You ought to see those things in the people who are teaching you and the ones that you're allowing to have a voice in your life. Now, let's think about what is the opposite of the good fruit? Because we might detect some things that aren't exactly, I don't know, of the Spirit, right? <clears throat> Glad you asked, because in Galatians, right by the fruit of the Spirit, Paul tells us what the fruits of the flesh are. If you're not a genuine believer in Jesus Christ, uh, these are the fruits you're going to produce. Rather than love, joy, peace, and patience, these are the fruit that you will produce in your life. And so Paul lays them out. He says, immorality and impurity, and sensuality, idolatry, sorceries, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, drunkenness, carousing. You can just go on and on and add to the list. Greed. So it seems pretty easy, right? It's almost like we could just like close up the sermon right there because, hey, as you're going in your life and you're going to listen to teachers and what you're going to emulate and follow, uh, if people are drunk, you don't follow them. And if people are full of spirit, you should, right? If people are full of joy, they're in. If they're full of jealousy, they're out. It seems like it would be easy. But I want to submit this to you. If this was easy, Jesus wouldn't be using the type of language that he is. He wouldn't be calling on us to beware and be diligent in watching out for. Did you know that oftentimes false prophets are going to speak things that we might even want to hear? That we might even wish were true? That false prophets might speak to some of the things that we wish were true about God. You know, like the God that we kind of made in our own image. The God that would enrich our lives and enhance our lives and kind of serve us rather than us serving him. And so Jesus, he calls on us to beware. 
of the false prophets. So the question would be, if this is hard, Jesus has said, hey, beware of this. These things are out there. You need to check the fruit of their lives to see if they're legit. How do we, a couple thousand years removed, like Jesus isn't probably going to come and stand in front of us and say, hey, here's the false prophets of your days like he did with the scribes and the Pharisees. How do we identify them in our day? And I really only know one way. And that's to know the truth. If you know the truth and you're acquainted with the truth, you love the truth, the lies are going to be easy to spot. I don't know if you've heard the illustration of the, of basically the agencies you know, around the world that are trained to spot counterfeit bills. Counterfeit money, right? There's counterfeiters out there. Uh, I, I used to dream about this when I was a kid thinking, you know, we got a printer at my house why don't I just print off some bills and I'll go and I'll, you know, I'll have some money to blow. Like life will be really good. Well, uh, unfortunately, and I'm glad I didn't do that, by the way, because had I, uh, I would have been caught because there are people who are well trained in spotting counterfeits. Now, the way that they train these people is not to teach them about every type of counterfeit bill and every way people might counterfeit uh, a 20 or a 100 or whatever. Instead, they train them to recognize the authentic currency. There are distinctions, certain identifying characteristics that are difficult to reproduce in a genuine bill, in genuine currency. And if you learn these little distinctions, these things that are hard to reproduce among the, the fakes, then suddenly the fakes will stand out to you like, oh, they didn't, they didn't, nope, they got that wrong. That's not correct. And in the same way for us as believers in Jesus Christ who live in a world where we have extraordinary amounts of information, right? Like you have the internet, you have Google, you've got everything you ever need to answer just about any question you would ever have. And yet when you think about today, isn't our world more confused than ever? Like basic things that we have always said, hey, this is right and this is wrong. Suddenly the world is calling what we thought was wrong right and what we thought was right wrong. Basic truths about humanity. People are arguing over these things. And so for us as believers, if we're going to go out and be salt and light, show people who God is following the way, the truth, and life, Jesus, like pointing them in the right direction, how do we, how do, we do this? And, and the, really the only solution I have is we have to know and love the Word of God. I read a study this week that said Christians are twice as likely to spend time on social media as they are in the Word. And the vast majority of Christians will have shown up this week, of people who purport to be Christians, will have shown up this week and they will not have opened their Bible at all. If we're going to be able to spot the lies that we're going to be tempted to believe, right? Jesus warned us for a reason. We've got to be well acquainted with the truth. I want to encourage you that this week you would begin to invest in that thing which will help you spot the lies and the counterfeits, and that is in knowing the truth of God's Word even more. So um, I want to talk about a few modern false teachings, if you will, all right? So I'm, I'm not Jesus. I'm not going to describe them all perfectly, and I'm certainly not going to cover all of them. But what are some modern false teachings? What are some ways that in our society today that I might see religious people thinking, hey, I'm on the narrow path, I'm headed toward life, when in reality they're headed for destruction? Uh, the first one of these is the works-based gospel. The works-based gospel says, this is kind of the gospel of eastern Oklahoma, by the way. If you live in our area, you're probably well familiar with this. The works-based gospel says, hey, <clears throat> I've been around church quite a bit. I'm a pretty good person, and so the way we're going to let this whole religious thing play out in my life is I'm going to be a pretty good guy and hope that in the end my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds and God's going to accept me. I'm going to be a pretty good person, kind of keep my word, be fairly moral on the outside. I'm going to vote the right ways. I'm going to espouse all the right things. And in the end, I hope that God's going to be good with me because I went to church and I prayed and I read my Bible a little bit. Can I tell you that that is a lie from the pit of hell? 
That is a lie uttered by false prophets that would wish to give men and women assurance that they were on the narrow way while they're walking the wide path that led to destruction. One of the things we love in the South, right around our area, is this idea of easy believism. Hey, I prayed a prayer and I walked an aisle. I think I'm good with God. I've done some outward things and so I must be okay. My good seems to outweigh the bad. And yet the gospel of Jesus Christ would call us not to look at the good works we've done and think they're good. As a matter of fact, the Bible would tell us that all our righteous deeds are as filthy rags in the sight of God. That even on your best day, you fell short of the standard of perfection of God. Easy believism says, hey, your sin's not that big of a deal because it's not as bad as someone else's. But the true gospel of Jesus Christ says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That if you broke the law at even one point, and let's be honest, you lied, we've done it, we've all sinned in some way. If you've sinned at even one point, then you've broken the entire law. And you are therefore a lawbreaker. Your sinfulness can no longer, God can have, God in his righteousness cannot have fellowship with your sinfulness. And so we are separated from God. And that does not go away because you lived a pretty good moral life and tried to atone for your sin. There is only one sacrifice acceptable for sin. And that was Jesus who came and lived a perfect, sinless life here on this earth. And then he went to the cross and his blood was shed there to make an atoning sacrifice for my sin. There on the cross, Jesus endured the punishment that I deserved. He spent three days in the grave and then he rose again victorious over sin and death. For us to think somehow that we're going to live pretty good lives here. Right? We're in the South. And we've been to church some, prayed a little, opened the word. But never come to true faith in Jesus Christ where our hearts have been transformed by the gospel. Listen, for you to think that your works are good enough is an insult to two things. First of all, the extent of God's holiness. He's perfect. But it also minimizes the extent of your sinfulness. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been pointing us over and over and over to take a look at our heart, even our motivations for why we would do good things, to help us realize that we are sinners in need of a Savior. Jesus says, hey, beware of the false prophet. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing. He pretends to tell you the way to life. In reality, he's pointing you the way to Destruction. The, the first false prophecy, the false gospel, is that gospel of works. It says you can be good enough apart from life-changing faith in Jesus Christ where you surrender your life to follow him. The second one we have, and this is really, it's kind of prominent here in the United States. It's been considered foolishness throughout, throughout much of history. But in a world where we have so much affluence and so much prosperity, another false gospel that gets preached a lot, especially if you watch pastors on television about, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, right? These are the guys that are going to tell you that you need to sow a seed of faith. And if you'll sow this seed of faith, right, that means write a check to their ministry, then God is going to bless you beyond your wildest dreams. That really God's intention for you is not that you would deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. You know, the cross, was, which was an instrument of death. That No, 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 that's not what Jesus wants for you. What Jesus wants for your life is health and wealth and prosperity. If you will just name the blessing you want and claim that blessing in faith, then everything's going to be smooth for you. Listen, I, I encountered this when I went to college. I was 18 years old and I left this church I went to Stillwater, Oklahoma. I, I joined a Baptist church there. The pastor leaves, and before long, the deacon, some of the deacons started distributing these pamphlets. And I didn't know what it meant at first, but I remember like hearing about church members complaining that they were in the hospital with cancer. And a deacon came by um, supposedly to pray for them, but he was telling them that the reason that they were sick and they hadn't been healed is because they didn't have enough faith. 
that they were really just living lives of sin, and that's why God had left them in that condition, that their prayers weren't ardent enough, they weren't trying hard enough, they didn't muster up enough faith to be healed. Can I tell you that kind of the root of that whole health, wealth, and prosperity movement was in Tulsa, Oklahoma? If you've ever heard of Oral Roberts, that's where this tradition comes from. And it's repeated over and over and over throughout our culture that it's not that you would deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. But instead, you would kind of invite Jesus to go on your journey with you just to bless you and enrich you and to make your life prosperous. I want to be really clear. Entering through the narrow gate and walking the narrow path, it is a life that Jesus said will be a life of suffering. In this life, you will have trouble. And Jesus says, hey, take heart because I've overcome the world. As disciples of Jesus Christ, it is a costly road we walk, but it's a road that leads to life. The final gospel I want to warn you about today is that of a social gospel. It's one where we would get busy helping people and doing things. We don't talk all that much about sin. We're not worried about eternity. We're just worried about today. And so we want to go and help people. Now, the scriptures would tell us to help people, right? like help the poor and the widows, the fatherless. We should be investing in those things. We should love our neighbor and be about that. But there is a movement in our culture today that would say, hey, don't worry about sin or the cross or any of those things. Just get out and get busy helping people. Again, we should get busy helping people, but those should be fruits of the gospel in our life, right? We receive the gospel. That's what naturally follows is that we would go and love our neighbor. Um, that is not the gospel itself, loving your neighbor. It's not going to earn your way to heaven. Like God's not going to be like, oh, you help some people. Don't worry about all of your sin. Richard Niebuhr described the social gospel like this. It gives us a God without wrath who brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of Christ without a cross. Apart from the cross of Jesus Christ, Every one of us is going to perish, and we're going to spend eternity in a place called hell. Every single one. And so while we do want to be active, light in the darkness, we want to love our neighbor, serve our neighbor, care for those who are hurting, we never want to neglect the true gospel, which finds all of us in our sins and in desperate need of a Savior whom God provided in Jesus on the cross. And so those are just a few things I want to warn you about, a few false teachings in our day. Uh, honestly, uh, you're going to hear these all over all the time, especially with the kind of the proliferation of technology. Uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I read a lot of books and things, and I, I see them all the time. So the question would be, how do we practice discernment in a culture of confusion? where so many people are trying to sell you so many things, right? If I can get you to buy into my beliefs, and I can get you to buy my book, which enriches me, right, if, if I'd written a book, right? That's kind of how it goes in our culture. You build a crowd, you build a following, you enrich yourself. How do we, in a culture of confusion, practice discernment? I want to give you three points, and then we'll, we'll finish up here. Um, number one, character. Jesus says you're going to know them by their fruit, right? Character is revealed up close, so be careful who you follow from a distance. Just because someone has a crowd following them and they speak with charisma doesn't mean that they have godly character. So characters revealed up close, so be careful who you follow from a distance. In 1 Timothy 3, Paul gave us the requirements of people that we should give authority to in our lives. These are the qualities of elders. He says, an overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine, gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money, not a new convert, must have a good re reputation with those outside the church. Those are not things you can observe from a distance. Those are things you have to see up close. And so before you buy into something, before you begin to follow after someone, someone who shows up with charisma, someone who has a lot of people following them, um, take your time, be careful who you follow from a distance. Number two, slow down because fruit takes time. We all know this in our lives. If you've ever planted a garden, it is painfully slow. You like walk outside every day like, oh, come on, I want to see some fruit. Um, 
be careful, go slow, because fruit takes time. In Galatians chapter 1, you can see Paul is like frustrated with a church in Galatia. He had preached the gospel there, and they had turned away from it. Here's what he says. He said, I am amazed. You can see his frustration, right? I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. He's like, man, I had you on a good path. Like, what happened? How did you get deceived so quickly? Then he goes on at the end. He says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. You know what he just said there? If you're hanging out at church one Sunday and an angel flies down from heaven and preaches anything other than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the gospel, he should be accursed. You should not follow him. Slow down because fruit takes time. The final thing I want to give you here is don't travel the path alone. We've all watched the National Geographic specials where the cheetah is pursuing the gazelle. You've heard it, right? You've watched the shows, and they're, they're creeping up in the bushes and the, the shadows, and then the chase begins. You know, every single time, the animal that gets devoured is the one that gets separated from the herd. Y'all, we need the church of Jesus Christ. We need men and women in our lives who can speak the truth to us, people who will shepherd us. That's one of the things that we as elders take very seriously is our role to be an overseer, to keep watch over the flock of God because Jesus has purchased us with his blood. You need the church. You need people who can speak truth into your life and point you in the right direction. And honestly, it takes some humility to allow others to speak in to your life. Like we're Americans, right? We go our own way. We know our own things. We don't want anyone to tell us our business. The trouble is that, with that, is that we might be on the wrong path. We need to hear what other people might say. I want to read this to you out of Ephesians 4, and then we'll close. Paul says, And he gave some as apostles and others as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And here's what he says. Because there are apostles and prophets and evangelists and gifts of all kinds in the body, all used to build up this body, here's the result. We are no longer to be children. Children are easily deceived, right? We're not supposed to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the crafty, craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. As Jesus concludes his Sermon on the Mount, he issues some warnings. Hey, be careful about which path you're walking. Are you walking the narrow path that leads to life, or are you just kind of being religious? If that's the case, you may be on the wrong path. Beware of false prophets that would tell you that faith shouldn't cost you anything, that you can kind of live your life and do whatever you want, go, go, kind of go however you want, and in the end, I think God's going to be good with you. Jesus says, beware of the false prophets, the false teaching. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for your word, and God, we thank you that you took the time to instruct us and to lead us to life. Lord, we don't have to wonder, like, where is the path to life? You said, hey, here I am. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. Like, here's the way. Walk in it. And so, Father, we pray that we would be faithful men and women who know the truth and love the truth, and we might walk in it, that we could say to other people, hey, come follow my example as I follow the example of Christ, that we would lead them on the narrow path that leads to life. Jesus, we desire to be faithful before you, light in the darkness, salt in a world that desperately needs us. And Lord, that's only accomplished through you and your spirit, so I pray that you would work in our hearts, reveal the lies we believe, and help us to walk in the truth. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.